the Visions 91 convention in Chicago, I met the lovely Sally Navet at a press conference. In the course of the press conference, we discussed her appearances on Blake 7 as the smuggler Janice Stannis, on the popular soap opera Emmerdale as Kate Sugden, as well as roles for women in TV, film, and the stage. We have a second dog that's a tramp that we adopted after it had been run over. Uh huh. So I nursed it back to health. It's part chow. More trained though. It's, all, it's a black But they they really do appreciate. They know, don't they, when you've uh, when you've rescued them? I mean, they they become so incredibly loyal. I have a friend who has two, and I mean. One of them she calls Cling City because it's like whenever she right. leaves, it's like you're leaving. Absolutely, and Bongo was sitting in my suitcase before I left to come yeah. here. I mean, she Ninja's that right. So she, she saw me packing. I went out the room and came back. She was lying flat on the top of my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> what the thing? So, but she always knows. I mean, she knows I come back. But she's, uh, she gets really clean. Who takes care of her while you're gone? Well, it's always a juggling act. So she, I make sure she has a lot of friends. She goes off for day trips with friends. People actually ring up to say, can they take her out? Because she's good fun to take out. She's got energy. But my dad took her this time because he's, uh, he's got a very nice woods just by where he lives and he likes to take her out. But I, I don't like to assume he'll have her because it's, uh, I do go away quite a bit. So I, I sort of say, either he'll have her or one of my good friends. Different each time. So she has a little overnight bag and all the various, <laughs> various list of people who she'd like to stay with. <laughs> so that's Bongo. <clears throat> anyway, what else would uh, would we? Uh, what are we doing this morning? I haven't a clue. Well, it's you're talking to me. I'm talking to you. We're all. You talk to me. <laughs> people from from like seven and other fan clubs, and we can run around and introduce ourselves. Just sort of doing a little more in depth than you can do on panels sure, with sure. an audience of thousands. Yeah. You want an introduction? I'm sure. Sherry Fillingham. I'm the editor of the Neutral Arbiter, which is a Blake Seven letter. So right. Where are you based? Washington, just outside of Washington. Oh, I've been to Washington. I'd love to go to Washington. Right. <laughs> Tomorrow, <laughs> on the way home. <laughs> and I'm Barbara, and I'm one of three people um, from the Cygnus Alphans, which is a Delaware Valley, South Jersey, Philadelphia area. That's right. We've met before. Yes. Yeah, last year. That's right. Yes. Yes. I'm Corinne Dunkel, and I'm also from the Cygnus Alphans. Right. So it's and, set up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. David Pugh from <laughs> Cygnus Alphans. <laughs> That's the end of us. Yeah. Rather Cygnus well Alphans. represented. Sorry? You said rather well represented. Very well represented. <laughs> and if we're lucky Self between three of us, we'll have one working day. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very efficient to get that together, yes. And I've met you before, too, haven't I? Oh, Me? yeah. Well, I've made, um, yeah. No, I've made, I've made. Bart Hazard uh, with Unit USA, we're a Doctor Who British media club. Oh, right, right. So, but you're, you're based over here, not, not in England? No, we're based, well, yeah. We're actually based on the East Coast, though. In New York? Um, Massachusetts, actually. Uh -huh. Oh, we do have a New York branch, as a matter of fact. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, that's right, Dan. Full of <laughs> interviews, yeah. I'm right. also with Unit from Boston, New York. Right, right. Boston, Springfield? Uh, well, actually, That's from right. about 30 minutes south of the city. I'm Don Ducharme. I'm from Orlando, Florida, with a group of Guardians of Gallifrey. The Guardians? Of Gallifrey. Oh, right. Oh, no, that's another place I want to go. I've got this great friend who, who designed the theme park in Orlando. Oh, which one? Jousting. Uh, and, um, oh, Medieval Times. Medieval Times, yeah, a guy called Chris, who went out there about mm, 10 years ago now to, to do this enormous thing. He was a set designer. Uh -huh. And then he got off at this fabulous job. Of Steampunk. Well, it's more of a uh, movie atmosphere now. Is it? Uh, Universal um, Studios, Disney Studios, and I even worked for a brief time on Superboy, uh -huh. which is one of the uh, shows produced every. It was at Disney and then it moved to Universal. Right. So it's kind of interesting. Gosh, I, I always mean to go out and see them, so that's another. That's and Medieval oh, Times God. has so, opened. There's a Medieval Times in northern New Jersey, right outside New York City. Right. There's one in that 10, 15 minutes from here. Really? Mm. Really? Yeah, yeah, a bunch of staff and guests went for dinner there Wednesday night. Sorry? A bunch of staff and guests went there for dinner Wednesday night. Uh huh. Ball. Is it good, is it? Oh, it's great. Oh, well. Oh, that's because that's right. Hang on, we were meant to go. It was the night we arrived, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right, but we were just. I was just too late. Jousting after a <laughs> smart ride and throwing up on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Just oh, generally. Oh dear. <laughs> because Peter, Peter, uh, mm. par excellence. 
So, okay, well, so that's, that's you. So, <laughs> what? So, what? Uh, uh, do you want to know? What do you want to know? Very your question. Didn't you? Uh, haven't you started your own production company? Um, yes and no is the answer to that. I haven't got a fixed production company. I have done. I think I may have told you this last year. I, I uh, had done two short films, one of which was a Guillaume Passon um, short story, and then I submitted that to the National Film School, who gave me um, a bursary if I had money to do another one. Um, so I did a thing called The Emperor's Waltz. Um, my intention is to form my own company, but then what happened was I got Emmerdale. So in a sense, that took me away. I thought that I'd be able to work on the two. I must have been completely insane. <laughs> There's no time to do anything except work on Emmerdale when you're doing it. Plus, it took me seven hours north away from where I'd been working before. So. Um, I haven't as yet formed a proper company, but I do now have a project which will probably be the basis of forming my first actual professional company. Um, and this is really all in, in, in negotiation at the moment. It's, um, I mentioned it yesterday, it's, it's, I've been asked by the cultural attaché of Romania to take some classic um, English plays out there. And if I do that, I mean, I'm going to have to um, work funding very, very carefully, because I mean, obviously, if you're going to take 10, 15 people to Romania, that involves a lot of money. And um, I should probably start it off by putting on a production in London and use that to raise the finances and then take it from there. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I want to juggle the two. I don't want to stop acting, because I love acting. But I equally don't want, I mean, I've had to stop directing for the last two and a half years, because I didn't the so. Now it's time. I always said I wouldn't do more than two, two and a half years on the soap. It's, uh, it's a very seductive business because there's so much money in it. And it's such secure work. It's, it's really, I can see how people get stuck in them for 17 years, which half the cast I've been working with be working for 17 years. And it's, uh, it's a really, um, it's, you have to make a really tough decision. Say, right, I'm going to stop this now and, and, and get out there and start grinding. It'll be really tough to start this company because it's, you know, it's like anything, getting finances when you're doing something for the first time. But at least I have a bit of a name behind me in, in the sense of being, when you're a soap star, in inverted commas, literally. I mean, it's, 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 it, does, it does help. So we'll see what happens. Can you give us a brief... <coughs> exactly. I mean, is Emmerdale Farm sort of like, con I guess it's contemporary country? You know it is over here, don't you? I mean, I'm not sure. Well, it's not where I am. I, I mean, About I five or six people have come up to me and said oh. they've seen episodes recently. Okay. Um, but there are episodes of before I got married, when I'm just meeting the guy. Um, Fraser. Fraser, exactly. Yeah. And how I, I, he's just shot my dog and all this. <coughs> and how it, it's a classic stuff, you know, I, I come into the village and yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a a very the outside strong heading, woman. outside woman, divorcee with two teenage kids, not the slightest bit interested in men or a new man. Yeah, and within, you know, <laughs> three weeks I'm passionately in love and desperate to get a church wedding. Um, which I used to fight, I used to fight the scripts like crazy because I, I thought psychologically they were very implausible at times. Hmm. Um, but it has been running that long? Oh, it's been running, it's enormously popular. I mean, it has a sort of 14 million viewing public, which in England is pretty high. Yeah. Um, and uh, it goes out twice a week at 7 o'clock. And um, we do 110 episodes a year. <gasps> which, so that's why I had no time yeah. to do anything else. I mean, you work at really, you, How you, can you? <coughs> you work on four episodes at once, at any one time. And sometimes you do a thing called the double strand, which means you do eight episodes at once. And that is truly, because you can't get 110 episodes into the weeks. Um, over the year, you have it because of various holidays. 104 is if you double, yeah. Right, but also there's you know there's two weeks, for, two weeks in, in June and there's two weeks of Christmas off, so um, you have to double up occasionally. And in that sense, you have two directors <coughs> both working on four bl blocks of four, and the actors are going like yo-yos between the lot of so that's eight episodes. You're and you're doing them inside out, backside front, and you're doing. You normally do a location week, a studio week, a location week, a studio week. In this case, you're doing location, uh, 12 o'clock, cars outside, you're leaping off back to the studio to do another four episodes with the other director. And then you finish them. Right, okay, right, you've still got to go back to the farm to do another 
end of the day location shot with the other director. So you are literally like a yo-yo. And they ferry you around because you can't. And it's not studio bound the way most say American soaps tend to be. No, much what of the time. is particularly good about it is it's shot on the Yorkshire Moors and it is absolutely spectacular countryside. I mean, I think it would be very interesting for American people because it is, you know, the beautiful English country. Like all creatures, really small. It, it's exactly, same, that same same, area, yeah. exactly that same area, exactly that same area. And uh, it is known to be, I mean, its particular appeal is the fact that it is the English country life. Um, of of not not the upper class the, the mm. simple country life, although there is there is now an element of the nouveau riche come into it. Uh, Do you actually bring that into the series? No, I don't. Um, uh, the, a, a family was brought in after I was brought in by the same producer. We had a producer who came in from Brookside, which is the other big soap, and he cha has changed the program a lot. He first of all brought me in with the two kids, and then a year later he brought in a family called the Tates, who are sort of frankly nouveau riche. Um, uh, business people, and she's a very glamorous sort of horse rider, and uh, they have this enormous house called Crestgeld Hall, and Joe, who's Fraser, um, mm. is always battling with them. Okay. But since I've since I have left, since I've left poor Joe, poor Joe, it's so sad. Mm. And, uh, since I've left him, um, he's apparently the storyline has gone that he has moved into Crestgeld Hall, which will please Fraser no end because he he can't bear working for be in the sets. He likes to, he likes to be working in the sort of Smart, you know, the, the, the smarter and more glamorous, the better. And certainly, Fresco's always beautiful. Wasn't uh, <coughs> a character put away? Oh yes, I mean, it, I had a lot of wonderful stuff. I mean, <laughs> they really wrote in very much better for me than they did um, in Blake Seven. I mean, I think this is an art, a thing. I, when I was younger, I really didn't know how to get them to write for me, and I think this time it, it worked much better. Um, I had a lot of dramatic stories. I, mean, I had an ex-husband who was always coming back to try and kill Joe and, and get me back and get the children back. And I go off and sort of have, almost have an affair with him because I get sick of the, the, fam the farm and the family life. Um, I have, and my daughter has an affair with a married man and I find out about it. And uh, I have a lot of stand-up confrontations, battles with him, finally I kill him. Um, I've run him over in a drunk and driving accident. Um, and pretty effective. It's pretty effective. I mean, you know, the storyline is so implausible, it's not true, but it, 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 it caused a lot of excitement and drama. Um, um, actually, it happened after I just had this really dramatic scene with him in the pub and I slapped him, and then I get increasingly more drunk with my old best friend who's come into the village and is leading me astray. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then, totally rat assed I drive off into the night, you know, still furious about this man, screeching round the corners at midnight with the rain pouring, and suddenly there's this figure in the middle of the road, in the middle of nowhere, and I just go straight into it. Of course, it has to be me to have just been. Um, and I leave him, leave him to die, and I don't even get out and look. Because <laughs> my, my, my friend, your evil my evil point. friend says, no, he's all right, don't worry about him. She gets out of the car, sees him half dying or twitch. Mm -hmm. She sees him twitch, so she assumes he's alive. Gets back and says, you can't stop because you're over the limit, alcohol wise. So I go home, and the next minute, in the morning at dawn, the police cars are there to pick me up. Then there's a long court case of will she, won't she get off because of the the pressure I was under with my daughter being seduced by this man and all of that. And finally, I do go down, which is a great shock to everybody. I mean, nobody thinks I will. So I've put it inside for two years. Um, that was at a point when I wanted to leave the series. And then last Christmas, they rang me up and said, come back or die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, I said, well, I don't want to come back. But then I thought strategically, and I thought, well, I don't actually want to die either, because, you know, it's, it's kill a, off a character and so. So I went up, um, back up to Yorkshire and had lunch with the juice and got him pretty drunk. And, <laughs> and suggested that um, it would be a good idea if, um, if perhaps Kate came back and was so traumatized. Is that? Sorry. <laughs> oh, my head. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of asthma. <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. We had a lot of trigger outside. Um, what was I talking about? No, uh, so, I, so, I, so, I so traumatized when I come out of prison, I haven't had any counselling, and my family aren't able to cope with, you know, how to deal with an ex-jailbird. And so I come back, and instead of it all being wonderful, it's dreadful. You know, I, 
I won't get, I won't sleep with my husband. I don't know how to communicate. I'm paranoid that the village hates me. And I really go from bad to worse. I, I sort of reject everybody. And so I've become the most hated woman in Yorkshire now. There is poor Joe, that poor Joe. He's got no luck with women. <laughs> <laughs> so I, at the, as it is at the moment. Oh, there's more than that if it doesn't matter. That is strong. I'm no, they're quite... just plain straight aspirin aspirin. Okay. Thank you. I'm clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as it stands at the moment, I have gone to live with my father in Sheffield. Daddy has taken me in again. I've sort of had a bit of a breakdown. And I'm there on ice until such time as I can no longer face the big wide world and I rush back to the soap world. But I don't think that's going to happen. But it's nice to know that it's there as a safety net. Maybe we can do a special occasionally. Uh, well, that would be great. You see, I mean, if I had such a character, you see, there are characters like the vicar and others in the series that can come in for short spells. But because I was so central, I couldn't actually just come in. If I, if I said I was coming back, I had to sign for at least a year. Maybe we could suggest that you're still traumatized, but you can appear for like holiday specials. And well, right, I agree and with you. Days. I cannot. I mean, so far there's been absolutely no mention of how I've dealt with the kids. And I mean, you know, you don't just disappear and leave your children with your your husband who is not their father anyway. You know, I mean, you just don't, I mean, however bonkers you are. And I mean, from the moment I left, you know, because they didn't want the viewing public to get upset, they had everyone, the kids and Joe, saying, oh, well, it's much better she's gone. Because wow. <laughs> otherwise they got so many letters sort of saying, you know, it's, it's bring her back. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I would have thought a plausible storyline would be to, you know, I'm beginning to get a bit better, I want to see my children, get, you know, pop back occasionally to see the kids, like my ex-husband did when he was trying to, to re-get me back. So that's, that's a sort of a really potted story. I mean, I've been doing it for two and a half years, so it's, there's, there's a lot in it, you know, I mean, I can't remember half the storylines. It's been, it's been good to work at that pace and that intensity, but you do need a break too, because it is, you know, every night you have to go to bed at 10. Somebody was asking me just now, I was saying, God, if you're finding it difficult to get up now, how on earth did you <laughs> find it difficult? Mm. What about when you're on location? But the difference being that uh, you're not with a whole lot of people who want to go out for a meal in Chicago at night and, <laughs> <laughs> and have a good time. I mean, your lifestyle is you get back home to where you're living about 8 o'clock at night, you grab something to eat and you sit down with your script and then you go to bed. And that's it. And it's pretty, two and a half years of that is pretty hermetic lifestyle. With American productions, you pretty much eat on the set. They have a little catering service. And oh, we have that, them. yes. We have all that. And yeah. you go past a certain time during lunch, then they provide dinner. Yes, we're exactly the same. I mean, we're meant to. We always have breakfast when we arrive. It's a big character. Very occasionally, you always have lunch. You always have tea, too, which is always scones and cream and all that. And far too much food. Yeah, um, they never, never they, starved. That there was always. Food oh there. no, I mean, it's, it's actually trying to resist the food because yeah. you know you're not trying to get to the costume. <laughs> <laughs> and but you know, there, obviously that you do have to have, get home and do things that you do at home. And have you know, eat at home too. And, uh, and I lived miles away from the location because I chose to live in a, a very remote part of the country, which was quite beautiful. But. Um, it was tougher because I had to drive an hour to location every day mm. and an hour back. So it was that was my choice. Not very few people did that. But that when I did get home, my dog and I could go off onto the moors and forget about you know, have an hour. So I was to be seen tromping around the woods with my script in hand, muttering to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so the locals said I was completely insane. Mm. <laughs> Well, there's a famous American <coughs> soap actor who like went upstairs for a nap before dinner and came back downstairs something like 12 years ah. later. <laughs> yes, I may be some time. What's that wonderful quote? Yes, so yes. I'm just going to going outside for maybe some time. Mm -hmm. Which one was that? I don't remember now. I don't follow the soaps. It's just one of those famous stories they circulate about, you know. It does sound like the British soap operas are starting to catch up with American soap operas with plausible storylines. They These want are nighttime what? soaps, yeah. aren't they? This is a nighttime. I mean, it, yeah. you know, I don't know how it will compare because I've not really seen your soaps. I mean, for me, when I, mean, I just come from more or less not long since I've been at university studying Shakespeare and Chekhov, and therefore the, the 180 degree swing I had to do from that to this. But within the soap world, I mean, I suppose it's not too, too bad. I mean, I did get very frustrated with writing. They seem to have a great need to have 
to that, these massive build-ups to the drama. Then the drama happens, and then it's forgotten instantly. There's no sort of, oh, they're coming from every direction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thanks awfully. I'll stash them out for later. Um, I mean, I, I, I got very annoyed at one point and, and went to the producer and said, look, she would not do this. And he said, darling, <laughs> darling, this is not art. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this this is money, this is so, this is not life. He said, you know, you, you can't, uh, when you've got something going out twice a week like that, and, then, and with so many people, he said, you can't get into the psychological subtext and all of that. You just but do have to. Somebody really has to, because if it's people actually of follow the these characters. Sort of. Sorry? People actually follow these characters. Well, I think, I mean, I do, in, in our case, it was very much uh, the individual actor who had the responsibility because the stuff they would miss, I mean, a very good case in point, for instance, was that when I came out of prison after having killed somebody in a drinking driving accident, there was a scene written whereby I drive up to the farm and look at the farm. Now, I mean, a moron would write that scene. She wouldn't be able to drive if, yeah. she'd been, if she killed somebody. They'd put me driving up and stopping. So, I mean, this is crazy. You know, the woman's on a drink drive charge for two years. And what manslaughter. And there were endless things like that. I mean, an independent divorcee begging them to marry her in a church. She wouldn't have done that. She wasn't even interested in getting married. They wanted a soap wedding. They wanted the drama of, the, you know, what's she going to wear, what's her hat going to look like, you know. <laughs> and, oh, Joe's a lucky man. And they, they, they want that, so they, they forego often the, the reality. The plausibility. Yeah, for, for, um, for what is spectacular or what they think they, the, the punters will like. And it is amazing how the people believe it. I mean, you get your character everywhere. So, you know. I mean, after, when I got married to Fraser in the show, and there was a whole stream of little ladies saying this. Just the right woman for him. He'll be very happy. He's very, he's very lucky, you know. And I hope you're going to be very happy for the rest of your life. I mean, they, they really, you know, they think that's yeah. what's happening to you. I think you see that a lot in soap opera fans, even in this country. Yeah. It's like, I mean, they talk about science fiction fans to bridge over, but oh. they really think they're real people and Absolutely. not characters reading scripts or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm constantly <laughs> amazed by it. I mean, I can't go anywhere in North England without that. Being, Oh, Kate, it's that Kate, you know, and it's, and it's, you'd know, think they'd separate the reality, but they don't, and it's, um... But they don't know the reality. They don't know, and this is what you've yeah, always got to remind yeah. yourself, and they do see you in their rooms twice yeah. a week, being Kate with Joe and all yeah. that, and so, you know, they've got very used to it, um, but uh, it is after all any action. <laughs> well, it's, it's also it's, flattering that you know, it shows how good a job you're doing it. Well, I, well, I hope so, yes. Yeah. I mean, I suppose so, it is, yes, it is. It's, mm -hmm. It is like that. I mean, I, you know, I mean, it's always pleasing to know that your work works. And mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I felt much happier doing this, even though I don't think it's brilliant scripts than I did take seven, because I really didn't know what I was doing. Actually, I have sort of a question on that, too. Like, your <coughs> character and I think David Jackson's, it's like they start out with a strong concept, and I think Nose dives. Yeah, because you start with really tough, you know, um, and then it's sort of like more and more they made you more passive. And oh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I tried to leave after the first year, and I oh, wasn't really? allowed to. Yeah, um, and uh, they had an option to take on all seven of us. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's only six things. David had gone. Oh, David was six weeks ago. Middle of the second. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and they wouldn't let me leave, so without suing and uh, getting into a lot of problems, so I stayed for the second year. But I didn't want to at all because I wasn't being written for. But I also didn't, it was a 50-50 thing because I didn't know how to get them to write for me. I was not, I was very inexperienced television-wise. And <coughs> I do believe now that an actor, no matter what the script is like, you can make a, a writer write for you. Um, but well, you, writers should write for every character. I think that's... They should. And I mean, Terry, yeah. I said this yesterday in, in a panel, mm -hmm. I don't know if you were there, but... Um, Terry and I met for the first time in San Francisco. Terry and I met about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And we got on extraordinarily well. And he just said at the end of the day, which is very nice of him, he said, uh, God, I really wish I'd known you when I was writing. He said, because I, I didn't have a clue how to write for the women. He said, Jackie actually ended up with the best. She had yeah, a large and life her. And she also knew how to, she had this slightly wacky, weird, weird personality when she, it, she could get them to write for her. Jan was a more experienced actress and also got to write for her more. I really hadn't the, um, the track record at that time. 
So it was, it was a mixture of him, as he says, I, I really did write much better for the men. Um, and the combination of that and, and my not knowing how to manipulate the situation to my advantage. Um, so I'd love to do it again then. God, I'd love to do it again. <laughs> Take over the bloody ship. <laughs> as they say, your character isn't dead. But no, we were talking in the last press conference with, with David Jackson particularly, and sort of that the difficulty, you start off with intelligent characters, and then the difficulty of writing intelligent scripts. The characters get stupid. They, they do stupid, simple things because it's easier to keep going. Also, the fact that, that Terry Nation, I guess, said after, I mean, he put together the first four scripts to sell the series. And then he didn't write them often. And then he did the draft, and he sort of said, you know, you can either have the second draft of this or the first draft of the next one. Absolutely. And uh, he, I mean, Chris Brouch, he lost art, and he went off to California and all of that. So the, its potential was amazing, and the reality was really disappointing. That's why I wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, there was no one there on tap. We were const I was constantly saying, look, can I talk to somebody about the way these scripts are going? She was an intergalactic space pirate. She should have been tough, gutsy, out there doing all the things that the boys are doing and more. Not saying, oh, Blake, there's a full storm coming, watch out. You know, she was, she was completely wet by the end of it. Um, and just a clothes horse. I mean, I had more and more hair and more and more sort of tight outfits. And that was, I was just there to be a sex symbol, which I couldn't stand. I mean, it did actually cause me to go off and leave the business for, for four years. I went off to university after that because I decided I didn't want to. I wanted to know how to, I wanted to feel confident enough to arm myself with a way of dealing with it. Because if you're quite young and you're in a big studio, all these men sort of saying, this is who you are, this is what you do, and you've not had a lot of experience, it's quite intimidating. And I, I just didn't know how to express my anger about it in a clear enough way to get what I wanted. So you were essentially what you were actually studying was that a directing course or was it a combination? It was a mixture. It was it was a it was a it was a degree. It was an honours degree, um, but it was um, it was English and drama, both sides. I'd never been to drama school ever, so I oh. fell into acting originally, oh. and I'd always felt that slight lack of experience. And I'd done about seven years in rep in the theatre, and I'd learnt a lot, but I'd done quite a lot of Shakespeare, and I often felt mm. I wish I'd really known how to cope with all of this. And then you know things went very well. I mean I. I got a lot of work for somebody who'd never trained and um, just worked on impulse. But, but it came to a point where I felt the lack of that base so strongly. And it, 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 the, um, the really the, the, the moment at which I decided, right, this is it. I really, I, either I, either I um, carry on and just get manipulated by the next job and the next job and become a sort of puppet, or I stop here and I go back and I. I educate myself and I decide what I want and I, I make the route for myself. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went, I took an A-level in that second year of Blake 7, which an A-level was mm -hmm. like an entrance exam yeah. to, and um, SATs. <laughs> Dear Villa Lorimer was so sweet when I left Blake 7, he said, good luck, Je Jelly, he used to call me Jelly or Jam, you can never remember my name, and he said, good luck with your O-levels, which are the sort of things you do when you're about 10. <laughs> uh, he was a, Gosh, it was a fruitcake, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did end up, you know, going uh, going to university, and it, it's changed my life. I'm very glad I did it. It gave me the confidence to to um, you know to now go out, come back, and to, and to, you're to feel more in control and to express myself and find what I want. From what I hear, you're probably better off because people say that coming out of drama school doesn't prepare you for anything, and either no. in the sense of the reality of either theater or television. That's probably changed, but. I think it's still true. I think it doesn't prepare you for the psychological traumas of being in the business, of you know, not working, um, of, of, of having to cope with, with selling yourself. It certainly doesn't teach you how to work in a TV studio at all. Um, you learn that by the seat of your pants. Um, it's, it's, it's quite frightening. What university does is it gives you a structure, in my mind, to, to approach all your work, whether it's this, whether it's theatre or drama or whatever. It gives you a a framework in which to approach things, and uh, and a confidence that nothing really intimidates you, and that you know you will explore it. Um, and it's it's that's what it's done for me. Um, and it also gave me that three years away looking at the business and thinking it's not the the be all and end all. I have gone back into it, mm. but um, I will never allow it to rule me as it can rule some people because it's um, I mean it, it can kill actors in their desperation to be working. Their insecurity of, 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 of 
um, you know, wanting somebody to give them a job, but it can really, it can really just ruin your life unless you keep it in perspective. So in my mind, unless I do the work I want to do, I shall make, as I said, do my own company and make things happen in my own way. May not earn masses of money, but I have an interesting time, hopefully, mm. which I think is much more important. Than thousands. I think different people have different ways of looking yeah. at it. I mean, some people are really keen on stashing up the money and, and then they only mind about the work. I mean, mm -hmm. as long as it's money, love, that's fine. And I, I can appreciate that. And they often have a lot more. They have large families and lifestyle they want to keep at a certain level. So. You have to decide what you really want. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the large percentage of people in, in Emmerdale wouldn't dream of leaving. They're absolutely on, they think they're on a hiding to nothing, you know, I mean, to, to everything. I mean, they've, they've got regular income. They've got, uh, they're treated, you're treated extremely well everywhere you go. Um, you know, they, and they're quite happy never to work in anything else again. In fact, it would be very, very frightening. I mean, there's usually a sort of crisis time around February when you get called to the producer to see if your contract's going to be renewed. And the paranoia that goes around the green room. God, I've got to go and see Stuart, you know. And, he's, yeah, and will my will my contract be renewed? Yeah, it must be pretty frightening if they've been on there for a while. They sure. decide to, to write their character out. Oh, and I mean, it's, ha it's happened. It happened. Three people got written out this year, and I mean, really devastated. One woman had been there for 15 years. Mm. And she went to all cast. the newspapers and just just took the producer the cleaners in the, in, the, in the tabloids. I mean, there was a real, <laughs> real drama about it. <laughs> But, um, it's, no, it's, it's different things for different people, very definitely. Thank you. I'm exhausted myself on that one. It's right, okay. <laughs> yes. A number of American actresses uh, have been quoted as saying there are no good roles for intelligent women. Ah, I disagree. I mean, there may not be in the film world in America. I think you've only got to look into the vast array of, 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 of uh, theatrical literature we've got here and in America you have it as well. I mean, there's some wonderful, wonderful parts for women. I mean, there aren't as many, and there never will be as many parts for women as, mm. as there are for men. But to say there aren't any is, is crazy. I mean, I know Meryl Streep and people like that say they, they, they wait two or three years to find her part. Well, <laughs> she's, she's right at the top there, and she's saying, I want the perfect part each time so that I can look as perfect as I've always looked. You she's know, she, quite a few. She's what? very versatile. She's very versatile, uh, but she, oh, so are a lot of actors, and, but she has this mm. perfect position mm. of being able to choose the cream part for herself each time, and one that she wants to approach, thinks, well, I'll approach that. I mean, there are a lot of actresses out there who could show how versatile they were in her, if they had her position. Um, but to go back to the, the general thing, I mean, the, I, there are billions of parts I'd like to play. Um, I, mean, I mentioned a few yesterday. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm very keen on Shakespeare, so it's at least eight of my parts I'd like to play. And I'm, you know, I'm in the middle age range. I and mean, he wrote strong, strong women at that age. He wrote very strong women. Yeah, I mean, through Lady the M, Gertrude, um, Beatrice, in, in much of you. Yes, but that's Cleopatra. Lady M. Cleopatra. I mean, they're, they're just endless. They're wonderful characters. Uh, he did know how to write women. So did Chekhov. So did Gibson. Um, there are great parts for women, there's no question, and, and uh, if ever you, I don't know how often they you get to England, but I mean... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very busy. What? No. I, I go on theatre binges from kind Well, of, yeah. but you do go specifically yes, for that, exactly. which is great, I mean, because yeah. there's, I mean, for instance, moment there's Vanessa Redgrave playing Isadora in When She Danced, or Where She Danced, quite brilliant, and then there's been Fiona Shaw playing Hedda, in Hedda Gardner, mm -hmm. again, quite brilliant. Um, and it's just endless, endless... Um, it keeps coming. Mm -hmm. And then between the, the RSC and the National Theatre and the West End, I mean, you know, if you go two or three, you know, you keep thinking, I'm missing this because it's only on for 13 sure. weeks or 26 weeks, you know. But it's nice to also think that maybe the world's progressing, that maybe there weren't... Well, they are going backwards. It's changing and there are becoming stronger women characters. Well, I think mm -hmm. in the parts you just mentioned, I mean, they're, they're ones that have been written for a long time. Um, I mean, check off century, didn't they? But I mean, and, yeah. and Shakespeare in the 16th, uh, 16th century, but I mean, um, uh, there are, I th there is an awareness that modern drama should have more women in it. I mean, there's always a split of 70, 30 men to women in most contemporary plays. And that is very depressing. I mean, that's, I think 
basically American actors tend to think more in terms of television and film and not theatre, don't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a general thing. Um, yeah. As whereas I think our English actors tend to think more in theatre, television, never film. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't exist. It's um, becoming a rarity. Yeah, I mean, it would be wonderful if you had a film industry and we just say it. Um, and, um, well, radio is the other thing that, that Stephen and David both mentioned. Well, radio is wonderful. Uh, I mean, it's, it's yeah, that's dead here, it's, pretty much as drama. Yeah, as well. yeah, we have a very good radio set up mm -hmm. in England. It's it's like anything though. It's, there's, there's a there's a. I mean, our 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 business is run by some pretty strange people, and the casting people are often people who shouldn't be in those positions, and they get their favourites, and, and and those that work work constantly. And then there's this mass of people outside that circle who should be working on good work, but because these people think so one-dimensionally, they think, well, if so-and-so did a good police moral stand-up comic in that show, he'll do it in that one and that one and that one. And so the casting, it's, it's always hard to penetrate a new... I mean, I've got to try and get rid of a soap Blake Seven type image because that's not what I am. I mean, what I want to do is something completely different. But to get them to think of me in a different way I've got to get that job for them to think of me, and so it's a, it's a vicious circle. Yeah. So I, and and the same with radio. To get into radio, I've just got to get that one job that will leap me in there. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And or, or the right agent, which is yeah. also um, part of our machinery. One of the things they were saying is because it, it's it's just verbal, you can do a, a range of characters where, but obviously someone has to choose you at the beginning. And, oh God, yes. And yeah. then and then it's sort of okay. Now we can. Begin to take your measure. Thirteen-year-old, uh, hundred-year-old. Yeah. Oh yes. I mean, you know, you're not you're not confined by the physicality of mm. your how you look on your body. So it's obviously it's wonderful. I mean, mm. as women get older, you know, that's the other thing. That, uh, darling, you're not New Ireland as beautiful and all of that. I mean, you're now a character actress, <laughs> and, uh, and suddenly you've got to look at all these, you know, these these mumsy parts and these. I mean, of which there are good yeah. ones, but yeah. there are, you know. There is this enormous pressure on, on actresses to stay young and look, look attractive. Um, I think the men feel that to a point too. Yes, I do, but I don't think as much. I'm not yeah. lost. I think uh, once they get past the uh, the leading man, then they're into the distinguished gentleman and. Uh, yes, but there is always so much more, so many more parts yeah. for men in that yeah. sense. I mean, when we have these endless political shows and I don't know, this, I mean. This, I mean, yes, Prime did you get yeah, that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, there's so many men in that, there's a few women. Uh, I love the show, but that's right. Great. <laughs> yeah, it's they have like one, as a matter of fact, sometimes I think they just have one female, like, you know, like, his wife, you know, the you know, Prime Minister's wife, like that lady, um... His political advisor. Yeah, his advisor. Right. <laughs> and she doesn't it's appear all the time. <laughs> and she was. And she only appears now and then. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, she comes and says a token three words, and she's off again, you know, <laughs> two episodes. I mean, it... Absolutely, uh, it's frustrating as hell. I mean, I'm I'm really looking forward to somebody who's going to write a sort of all-female series. I mean, there are the occasional ones. Mm -hmm. And even when you do get a female, it seems to be, I mean, at least over here, because I think PBS stations know Penelope Keith, so we get her in everything. Absolutely. I mean, we get no job for a lady because we got, oh, the other one she did. Penelope yeah. Keith yeah. and Penelope Scales are a very good case in point. Yeah. I mean, they are, they are good actresses, very good actresses, but they are, are millions of other as good actresses out there, mm -hmm. and it's so unfair that because they have got that niche, they now get all that work, you know. So the good work goes to the very. Well, Felicity few. Kendall is the Felicity. younger version. Absolutely. Uh, and you've only got to do the, the irony is you've got to do just one series to crack that. You know, I mean, they, she yeah. did um, whatever, not Good Neighbors or whatever it was. Yeah. 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 Um, that's the butterflies and grasses. I don't know that one. But it's Good Neighbors here. Oh, right. It's Good Neighbors, and then she did Solo. I don't actually, but we get them in all sorts of weird orders that have no connection to when they actually were yeah. filmed originally. So yeah. our chronologies are all shot yeah, It's just like in the UK. I mean, yeah. you're still watching things like Time Tunnel and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea over there, which is ancient to us. Yeah. And we're still getting Benny Hill and. Uh, Benny Hill? It's so yeah. Yeah. nice, here, really. Same way we react to some of the shows, yeah. like when uh, somebody says the A Team or, mm -hmm. or uh, Dallas. Dallas, so yeah, Dallas. Dallas, so cool. Dallas is still going on. It is. I can't remember. I never watched it, but I mean, I know it's been going for years. Dallas and Dynasty. Mm. 
dynasty. 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 I heard there were more uh, women directors in the television industry in England. Is that true, or is that false? It's it's become true. I mean, there are not there are not more than men, but there are there are more than more than in time. America. I don't know what the ratio would be, but I mean, I, there are certainly more women getting into the business. Thank goodness, because um, I I do believe um, you know women have great abilities as directors, and uh, uh, and f you know only 10, 15 years ago it was sort of mildly laughed at, you know, um, that, that a woman should direct, so, whereas now it's, it's very much accepted. And some of the big directors at the Royal Shakespeare Company are now women too, which is wonderful. Um, I think Verity Lambert was actually a... Uh... Yes, a Verity Lambert, I, I, I think indeed, and well, she's she a very, but, yeah, um, and she's, she's, She's never been a director. She's been always on the business side, the producing side. Um, and but she's done it brilliantly. And a great friend of mine is her assistant producer, Caroline Gould. Um, I, I mean, that's wonderful. I, I, as long as women don't go into that male power thing, that's, I mean, I'm not being really derogatory to men. As long as they stay women and offer what they have as women, um, well, you know, making a balance, obviously, but uh, I was talking about this with one of the actors here only yesterday, and we were talking about a particular woman act, uh, director, who I'd worked with, and he had too, and uh, he Fiona was saying, Cummings. sorry? Fiona Cummings. No, no, I mean, nobody would know no. her, um, but um, I know her, and I was interested in her work, and I thought she was very intelligent and very good, and he's saying, yes, yeah, she is good, but she is, uh, she's obsessive, and she reduces people to gibbering wrecks in her rehearsal program. That's that's very sad to me because I think that the one thing I've always felt that women have to offer is a is a, an ability to nurture those people that aren't quite getting where they should get to in in, in a rehearsal process. I've always felt that that's what I I've got to offer that I could notice somebody who's having a hard time to say right, come on, let's work hard on that area. And as soon as that can get stuck or paranoid, unless a, unless the director notices it and helps to draw them out and to relax them and to get their best work out of them, they will just plummet down and get worse and worse and feel alienated and, and, and do very bad work. And there's nearly always somebody in a cast who's feeling like that. I mean, I, I define, almost every job I've ever done, there's always somebody who's having a really tough time because they just can't get it right. Um, and I think that, uh, and I've heard male directors say, oh, for God's sake, darling, just do it better. You know, I mean, that's no use to anybody. What you need is, is for somebody to be perceptive enough to see what's going on, why you're getting paranoid blocks, and how to pull them out, and how to draw them out, and not reduce them to tears, and just to, you know. So, <coughs> it's, it's a particular little bandwagon of mine. I mean, I'm quite interested in, in uh, I, I've felt that women have come in from a different angle sometimes than some of the male directors, and, and it's very pleasing that more women are doing it. So, um, you know, so I think that further down the road, it'll be more of a, an equal sharing of both sides. Sure, 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 absolutely. We never had a female director on Blake 7 when I was there. I think they did after I left. A number of them, yeah. Yes, never, and that's, you see, that's indicative. I mean, I left in, mm. I know, it's only nine, I think. And mm. I think really at the beginning of the 80s, it started changing. I thought the scripts were generally pretty good. That Jenna was one of the few characters that actually supported Blake. I must generally sit behind him while uh, several of the well, characters. No, she didn't. The second season, she started going her own. I mean, she if started wasn't... being a little less supportive, but she was generally yeah. supportive. You know, this is the person you decided to follow. So, but I think no I didn't mind her doing doesn't... that. But I thought sometimes she was a bit too supportive, a bit sort of. I mean, well, when you she... have one character plotting against Blake, just about every time you went down on the planet, it's well, kind of helps to have one character that says, "No, no, no." We're oh, I agree, that. and I mean, you know, there always was that potential, you know, relationship that they never quite. You know, that would have been go. fun, I think, actually. Oh, it would have been fun, but as as, uh, as the producer said, or the director said, darling, once you've had the first kiss, where it goes from there? <laughs> You're on a spaceship and you can't get off. He said, it's, it's a six, seven o'clock show. That's you know, the other side of it, we yeah. Can't, we can't turn this into steamy passion, so you know, it's better not to have the kiss at all, in a way, but just to keep the frisson yeah. on there, which is always there. But um, now I did, did feel, though, that he, he became so much in charge and I became just his little sort of um, 
Like <laughs> <laughs> the, the fan parody Good becomes, friend. and the girls stay home and dust the liberator. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It was, it was, it was stereotype male. I mean, I'm sorry if you don't like it, but I think it is uh, a, a attitude of, of, of a woman's role. Well, what my part nice? was, I and mean, I was looking sexy, and I, I supported my man all the time, and you know, I basically never rocked the boat too much. I was occasionally had a, but basically I was always saying, oh, watch out, and then he'd have the long speeches, you know. Oh look, something's happening, and and I just wanted, to, I wanted, to, I mean, Weaver in Aliens. I don't know why, but I mean, well, she strong. she made the decisions. She got out there. She was active. She could that was shoot. Very strong. Well, that's how I would have liked to have been. I, could, I think I think Jenna could have easily been. Like, I as a person could have brought that too. Well, I should have done something to the media point where a flight has been captured, and with Serlan as as the actual villain, a female strong villain, it would have been nice having maybe Jenna. Have to go in and, and Absolutely, get Jenna. him out. Yeah. Well, they did do the one background episode, bringing in the pirates and, and sort of, you know, yeah, would good. Jenna give up and leave, you know, leave the yes, operator and go off? Right. Yes. And I mean, and that that actually gave, it essentially gave the background to the character as much as we ever saw. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And it was nice, at least that they, there was that, but then that it went from there back into the, the usual thing. Yes, I mean, there were times where I thought, oh, goody, something's really going to start yeah. happening now. And then it would always peter back into this, uh, you know, it's as though I'd had my one episode for the series, and then it would, it would, mm -hmm. it would go again. But, um, well, in the opening, when uh, Blake was recovering and Phyllis took his watch, oh, yeah. wasn't yeah. it Jenna that gave his watch back? Yeah, yeah. What time is <laughs> it? It was really nice to have. She's, 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 she's aware of what's going on. on. She's yeah. very street savvy. Streetwise, yeah. Right. yeah. Well, you were you were the celebrity as I mean the the villa line was oh she's a, you know she's famous um, among that that group right. yeah I mean I was I was world renowned yeah. being this, this oh, yeah, cool or, intrepid uh, intergalactic space pirate yeah. I felt I became Mrs Bloggs after a while <laughs> and that's a real shame you know yeah. I mean, she could have she could have been so much more and I as a person could take so much mm -hmm. but as I say I, d I honestly didn't know how to make that happen and I was insecure at the time. With the whole technique, I mean, you've got to remember, I didn't even know about which cameras were on me at which time, and you know, I mean, not. Well, I guess that. you and Michael and and Jan had done very little. Film. They'd done TV. more than me. They'd no, done, they, oh, okay. done a lot more than me. Yes, I'd done none. Oh. I'd done one TV thing before that, I think. And I mean, you know, Paul used to say, hey, "Darling, cap that the camera falls on you," and you know, <laughs> in that way that Paul does. <laughs> of course, you do. Right? Which drama school to go to, darling? And you know. <laughs> He, instead of making me feel better, I'd feel, oh my God, why I should be on camera for, you know. And it was always, I was always felt as I was one step behind, feeling very anxious about it. Mm -hmm. And we worked in such a way that we rehearsed. Then we did a technical rehearsal, and then we shot the whole lot in one evening. So there was always pressure of time, the clock was going, and you were so petrified of, I was any of those, those days, of, of screwing up, of losing a line, or, or doing anything wrong, or getting into the wrong position. It was like this tense sort of, I look at my acting in that and I just look so tense all the time to me. I just don't ever relax. And I, I can't bear it. I have to feel sick. Well, you were on the run, so it kind of added a little reality. <laughs> well, I know, but if you know what it was really, the tension was about his bloody camera paws on me. <laughs> well, David Jackson said there was also what he called uh, the rehearse record, where it was sort of like, we're going to film this rehearsal because we don't have time. Well, rehearse so record. You got into that. A rehearsal yeah, record is great, actually, yeah. and that's the way is the way to work, because you get a time to run through it, and then you shoot it, so you familiarise yourself mm -hmm. with it. The other way you work, which is like you've got 20 scenes, mm. you rehearse them all between two and four in the afternoon, then you have a lunch supper break, mm -hmm. so you get sluggish because of that anyway. Then eight o'clock, you're on, boing, you know, the, you're there, and suddenly you've got this 20 scenes, and you've got to remember all the little tiny things, you know. You've got to edge yourself around that way for that bit, and you've got to do that, and don't go further than that step there, and don't put your hand higher than that because that camera can't get you, and don't do that. And it's, it's like, all the, if you'd rehearsed it five seconds before yeah. you did it, it would be you, fine. Yeah. But, and actually, I've never worked that way again since Blake 7. Mm. I've never worked in that block way. It's, it's now redundant as a, as a way of working. Mm. Everybody rehearses records now. Yeah. And it's it's the only way to work. I mean, on Emmerdale, you know, you'd go in, you'd, you'd okay, scene 200, whatever, mm. you'd run it through, the cameras would get set up, and then you'd shoot it. And then you'd be on to the next scene, run it through, mm. shoot it. And it's, it's a totally different ballgame. Yeah.
much, much better. You mentioned that that was really your first major television you demoed. I think. How did you get the role in Blake 7? I, I had actually done something before that, which I, mean, I saw it on television. I actually had to go to the pub. I was so <laughs> horrified. Uh, mm. David Maloney chose me because of this, so he must have liked it. I just thought it was so dreadful. I, I did a thing called Who Pays the Ferryman in Greece um, with a, a wonderful actor who's now dead called Patrick um, McGee. Oh, wow. Wonderful. I played his lover. I was a junkie called Samantha, and I'd run away to the mountains with this man who had shot it, who murdered his wife. It was actually a mercy killing because she had cancer. And the police were after us, and we were hiding out in this village up in, in the Greek mountains. And I had this long speech, after we'd come back from location filming in Greece, I had this long speech which I had to do about how I'd become a junkie as a child. And um, that's what Dave, David came to watch me recording those in Birmingham. Now, I look at those scenes, and I just think, you know, the man must have been mentally... <laughs> retarded to, 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 to chose me for those, but he obviously liked it. I, I, I mean, you might see it on tape one day. I didn't think they were very good scenes, but um, that was my, I was, I felt I was always over the top. Again, there's this, I'd done a lot of theatre up until then, so I didn't know about, when nobody tells you, it's a mystique, you, you arrive in television, nobody tells you that instead of sort of doing all this and being uh, expansive, you bring You need know, to keep it right down. I was shouting away and throwing my arms around. I mean, it, it's magnified so much. And yeah. I, I was horrified. But um, the, the director on that particular show had an alcohol problem, so he, he just let you go. Let me go. But you know, I did. Maybe it looked more realistic, though. Well, he obviously wanted a fairly expansive character because she was a junkie and she she ended up sort of uh, getting a gun out on the police when he tried to take the man away and all of that. So I had to be fairly dramatic, but. There was a level of which mm. I think it should be. If I'd been the director, I would have kept me down. Mm. But we wanted um, So that's what I'd, I'd done that before. But I had done one other thing. What was it after? I think called Sarah, which I. It's probably the only other thing before Emmerdale that I've been proud of, which was a very good um, play with Nigel Hawthorne, mm. who's in. Yes, Prime Minister. Among other things, yes. yes. <laughs> Lovely actor. Yeah. And I played his daughter who had... Um, um, it was about um, dysfunctional families and the effect they have on their children. And this warring couple and how they manipulate the daughter because of their relationship and how she finally breaks away from her parents. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that was, in my, my book, a very interesting piece to do. It was true to life. It was well written. And it was, you know, it's sort of thing people get through all the time. And it was a great part for me, I was a central character. And in that I got well directed. You know, we were filming it on location and there was a good director in each day. And that's what a director should do. Sadly, a lot of directors on television do not direct because there are two parts to directing. I mean, there's writing your camera script, um, getting the cameras right, thinking about all the lighting and the physical stuff. And a lot of them are so pressurized for time the thing that gets left out is working on the character. And they just don't. I mean, they never did on Blake 7. Nobody ever mentioned anything about it. Mm -hmm. And they also don't actually on Emmerdale. But because I was more experienced on Emmerdale, I knew how to work on it myself. But I watched people coming absolutely terrified on Emmerdale. I mean, that awful look of stunned rabbit in their eyes as they're doing their scene. <laughs> and, and 40 you know, million you, people are going to watch I it. Don't I don't know. All I can think it. about is, God, this is going out to 40, 40 million people. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and the directors don't help them at all. I mean, there were two or three people in the time I was there who came in as visiting actors who just couldn't handle it. And it's very hard. You come into a group of people who, do, who you don't know, who are all terribly relaxed and easy with each other, and you're absolutely petrified. And, Enormous pressure, to, and and the director's just not there helping. Oh, just stand there. No, no, edge over there a bit more. You know, do this, and they don't actually see that the person is it needs to be relaxed and needs to be helped a bit more than the regulars. Um, yeah, one thing. So, sorry. No, go ahead. No, no. I mean, I was just basically. I mean, that's what I was saying. It's back to the same old thing. Mm -hmm. Directors should direct, and they often don't. But there is always a time pressure. Um, if you're doing four episodes at once.